great. Now we can start. Okay, so I think the last presentation was exactly where I would like us to start. Um, just to start, to get it started. Um, um, when you showed um, 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 when you showed this um, a picture of one of your colleagues, um, I immediately thought about Minority Report and Tom Cruise trying to, you know, predict you know future crimes, right? Um, so um, the question mark. Um, how, um, for example, these um, new extraordinary capabilities we have now in hands uh, could be utilized um, for more predictive and more, you know, um, quantitative uh, visualization capabilities. Anybody? Anybody? Or yeah. you want Go. me to yes, respond? Sure. Yeah. Oh. So I don't think I understand, understood your question perfectly, but <laughs> I'll give it a stab. So you think, what is the new technologies that we might use to harness to solve some of these difficult challenges? So I was, I don't have the full answer, but I think some of the advances that we've made in computational science would definitely aid in a bet. Uh, so some of the key things are, we separate modeling from analysis. So we call, you know, the numerical calculations or the simulation or the analysis is uh, we can now do things adaptively, we can do them at uh, different resolutions. But then there's the models itself, there's a hierarchy of models. Uh, and so we have to come up with this straddling technique of doing hierarchical modeling coupled with hierarchical techniques. So as one small example, your Solving for at a what's called the molecular mechanical model at you know protein protein interactions, you're using something called a MMPBSA model. But PB today cannot be done in real time, so if you wanted to really do a full dynamics couple with PB, it would tie up all your supercomputers. Andy has been working on this challenge for several years, and he can tell you. But PB is very approximate. And it's to discover really where there would be need for going to a quantum model. I think that's where the discovery is. So that's the first level of discovery, is exactly what quantity of interest requires you to go to a finer scale physics, such that the errors that are made at the current scale of your simulations are not adequate enough. And so discovering these key things uh, is what I feel is a, a one of the things that we should be doing. So, of course, audience, please do ask questions if you have, and just raise your hand. Um, so, in the meantime, if I can ask Art, uh, do you think that you know our major uh, bottlenecks and challenges are in technologies, or simulation, or there maybe in people? All three. <laughs> uh, I think I think we there are bottlenecks uh, everywhere, and I think, kind of following on with the the idea of technology, um, things uh, problems change when they become interactive, and uh, when we can change things as we're thinking about them, and so I think that that uh, for one thing. Let's say you, right now, I think the bottleneck for most of these large molecular simulations is actually building the model. So you have to very, very carefully choose what model you're going to build because it takes so much human time. If you could build models automatically and very quickly, then you could test the, the variations. Of, the, of those models. So uh, the ability, uh, you know, the software and the technology to build models, I think, is an important um, bottleneck to, to break through. Um, there are also other bottlenecks. I, uh, when you talk about collaboration, the major bottleneck is, is actually getting ideas across from one person to the next. And uh, we need all the help we can get in doing that. We found just simply having a physical model uh, in our, let's say, HIV program project where we can talk and point instead of fiddle around with the computer actually speeds things up and increases the collaboration uh, information flow. So there are lots of, lots of areas where there are bottlenecks. And I think that uh, 
The fact that technology is changing so quickly means that if we can adopt that technology for our purposes, then I think we can speed up the research. So, Ross, please. Yeah, I have a follow, yeah. follow up to that, to, to one point you just made, which is when you say the time in building a model, like what, a, what aspects of the model building are particularly cumbersome? Is it, is it getting the geometries right, or is it d deciding what all the various constitutive pieces are, or, or, or is it the governing equation? Well, it's, what's it's the, all of those things. You know, as David mentioned, putting the, getting the information together is a, is a major bottleneck. But even if you have the information, something simple, uh, somebody wants to model a membrane with different types of phospholipids. Just building the model with different phospholipids, actually making a physical so laying geometric, them out, let's say, laying in, them in out 3D. Uh, right now is a very cumbersome process. Okay. If you could just speed that up, uh, that would help. Uh, may, I, may I add to that just a little bit? So, you know, in some sense, models mean lots of things for lots of people. Uh, and, of course, we come from diverse backgrounds. But at least at one level, we can think of a domain model, which is the three-dimensional spatial laying out of things. And then there's the, the physics. And so the reason why I agree with also Art and, uh, is that um, we always start with a hypothesis. What is it that we are trying to build the model for? And what we, we don't know everything about the physics or the chemistry or the biology that goes in. And we are playing this approximate game. We says, okay, well, what's something which is very close to the physics that's represented at this scale? And we put that physiological model in place, and we have to couple it with other physiological models. And then we go back and do an analysis. And we have to find a way to validate if that quantity of interest that we wanted to compute or the hypothesis that we were doing is correct and what, how uncertain is our prediction. And when we find that it's not, then we're going to this refinement loop of going back and rebuilding the model. So building the model is, you know, the initial model is hard, or it's difficult, and um, because we're working with soft things too, uh, but um, the final refinement step, it's a continual process. And so this is the uh, reason why that's a key factor too. So I'd like to come back to what I think is the main focus of the workshop, and that's building virtual cells, perhaps for simulations. First address your comment and put to the crowd to discuss terminology. So as I said in my long comment earlier, if you just use a word like workflow and you bring computer scientists in the room, and you assume they all understand what you're talking about, it ain't true. When you use the word model, there's a problem. Art and I are old enough, he's older than I am by a lot. <laughs> but Art and I are old enough to remember, and he showed physical models. I'd like to put forward for argument that we reserve the term model, even though it hasn't been used this way, for the in silico representation of what's observed experimentally and that we reserve the term simulation for what we do to that model. Now, what you do to make it simulatable, the annotation, putting in the in silico representation what's needed to enact the physics, that's an intermediate step. Okay, so that's just hanging there and meant to cause some discussion. We need to get to where we all understand when we use a word what we mean. But there's a bottleneck problem that you brought up, and I would posit that today, as an imaging guy, I can image all the way from the molecule to the whole cell. I can fill the space, just like uh, Good Cell has been doing artistically. And our big problem, which I pose to my computer science friends, is that we don't have enough tools for segmentation and annotation. We can't go through those extremely rich uh, scenes, pull out the knowledge that our imaging techniques give us, and attach it to knowledge that's in the literature, let's say a solved structure from crystallography. So that's the bottleneck I see, is that we can make the data, we can't name what's there. David, do you want to comment on this? Well, um, I'll make a comment. Oh, oh David, go ahead. Just that, um, that, that mesoscale segmentation issue, uh, do you really think that that's possible now? To 
to come up with a, a 3D data set segmented at the molecular level for a significant portion of the cell? Yes. Okay, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I agree with Mark's uh, definition of model and simulation, um, but um, in, in following on with discussion from earlier today and bringing it up to, to now about the idea that um, you know, the, the database and the model should be one, um, the needs of simulation are uh, more data, uh, more that are actually part of the model, right? So if, you, if the uh, models have different purposes, um, if the purpose of your model is to make a simulation, then you need additional data uh, in, uh, to become, you know, uh, in the model in, uh, in order to make the physics come to life. So um, I, I agree that you know, the model should be, the term model and the term simulation should be uh, used carefully and, and they're separate things. But if the purpose of your model is to simulate, then you certainly need um, the additional data in the model that makes the simulation possible. And, and I would assert that if, if you have the purpose of using your model for simulation, um, uh, there were, you know, there were the requirements of 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 this additional data that you need are are quite stringent, and you know, of course, every model has to be constrained by experimental data, and models intended for simulations are, you know, doubly so. Well, let's continue the discussion. We have somebody there, please. So my question. Um, so a lot of the visualizations that we're seeing um, and trying to make are visualizations of what you would see under a microscope, what you would you know, kind of see in our real world. Um, but going off the point made earlier, um, is it also I mean, what kind of work needs to be done towards um, abstract visualizations or you know, the making of graphs and figures and these types of things of you know, getting away to better understand the information rather than just try and see exactly what we're seeing in the real world kind of to further our understanding? Ross, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would agree. And so just as the, the imaging problem is too large to, to deal with, with sort of, let's say, state-of-the-art tools for hand contouring things and so forth, the simulation as well is going to be too big, right, in its, in its scope to be able to digest in any reasonable way. And so, and I think both of those problems really get to the issue of analysis. So. Un, you know, underlying visualization. I, I mean, I think it's important that we develop, you know, bigger screens and methods of interaction and so forth. But, but it's. I think it's. In fee, it's not realistic to think that that's that sort of technology will keep up with the size of the images and corresponding models. And so, on in, in the middle somewhere, there's going to have to be a whole set of analysis tools. Um, and w I don't think it's all clear yet what those tools look like. I can say that there are some other fields that I think are farther along in terms of developing those those tools, and um, you know, I think I think for instance, certain certain areas of medicine are further along in terms of being able to automatically analyze these kinds of data sets. And Mark and I have, have talked about this over the years, but I think one of the things that you know I've worked a little bit in, in microscopy, and I have colleagues who work more than I do, and one of the things that's difficult about microscopy is the imaging technology seems to be evolving sort of so quickly that, you know, in order to develop that, that set of tools, at some point you need to kind of agree on, okay, this is the class of data that those tools are going to work on. And once you do that, you know, yes, it'll take some years for whatever, the computer vision or the, or the machine learning people, you know, to, to develop, right, the infrastructure to deal with it. But, but what's interesting about microscopy is it does seem to sort of develop, uh, you know, kind of on, you know, sort of continually, and, 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 and every shop kind of has its own type of imagery, and we've seen a, lo a lot of different kinds of imagery up here today. And so I think, in some sense, there's, there is, to, to, to tackle that analysis problem, there needs to be a certain economy of scale um, and a certain kind of stability in what it is that the problem looks like. And I think 
you know, that is a challenge I think that this community is, is going to face. Um, Chandrajit, do you want to add something? Yeah, so I, I kind of um, agree, but I also disagree. So not everything that we've shown has tried to repeat imagery because images, uh, we don't have a, at the, it depends on which scale. At the, uh, you know, electron microsco microscope scale, we don't have a video camera. We can't see how a molecule behaves. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible at this stage to go back and repeat every little femtosecond event that occurs. We can do certain snapshots, and we try to interpolate between those snapshots, and those are our validation points. So many of the models, it's not just machine learning or computer vision. It's the whole area of what we are starting to call computational science, computational physics, computational chemistry, computational biology, computational, you name your word, has to come together to capture the nature's laws. And so, Images provide you just snapshots. They don't give you the complete picture in time. Thank you. We have a question up there and then Peter. So I think uh, Art made the uh, remark earlier that communication between people is difficult and it's difficult to get ideas across. But I would posit that uh, communication between the models is even more difficult. And um, um, my question to the panel is, um, do any of your models talk to any other models, or are these models actually only used by the group that developed the model? Art, do you want to, Art, do you want to answer that question? Well, <clears throat> uh, I don't want to uh, kind of jump ahead of Graham's presentation, but uh, the models that uh, this auto, auto pack or cell pack uh, are have been put out in, into the world, and there's actually a contest for people to use these models, uh, mostly for visualization at this point. But uh, I think I think that's an important thing to get these things out in the world and have people use them. Um, it's you know the discussion earlier about well how do we how do we get people to uh, to use our models? My my thought is that, uh, you know, is survival of the fittest in some, in some sense. If people find something useful, then they'll use it. Yeah, so so this will grow as the field matures, right? Because if you look at uh, atomic structures of proteins, which David, could you please come closer? Field, yeah. Sorry. If you, if you look at uh, atomic structures of proteins, which is a very mature field, there are thousands of different applications for that, just because the underlying model is so mature that and stable that people can build upon that. And that'll happen as, as this field matures as well. So can I ask the same, answer the same question, younger generation, please? Can you comment on this? This is new, I think. Not what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Even younger generation, sorry. <laughs> Missed even. Uh, well, I, I probably don't have a particularly good answer, but uh, I mean, I, I, w I was sort of struck by in some of the talks that we've heard, um, the sort of essentially taking really small molecular scale data and building these really complex sort of visualizations and simulations and whatnot. And from the perspective of what, you know, what we were doing in our lab and the project and whatnot, uh, it's, it's kind of peculiar because we, we theoretically could make some really complicated model of the chromosome or whatnot, but we are also, one of the problems that I think we face is uh, we're essentially taking a snapshot of like a single cell, or, or not really a single cell, a population of cells, and trying to infer, uh, you know, sort of a, a single function or whatnot. But inevitably, each of those cells in that population is probably behaving in a slightly different way. And I think that, I mean, it, it may not really be related to exactly what we've been talking about so far, but I, I do think that that's sort of one problem that we deal with is that if you do, you know, some sort of visualization thing on an individual cell, you can see variability between one cell and another and another. So, you know, when we are trying to build these sort of chromosome-wide models, sort of a, a single model of, of you know, what, whatever we're interested in, we, we always have to sort of have this caveat in our minds of variability between different entities. 
I, it may not be related, but that's sort of my two cents on that. Great. So I think Peter would, would need to talk now, please. Okay. Um, Peter Hunter, Auckland. I just wanted to make a point which may, maybe has partly been addressed in the meantime anyway, but relating to some earlier comments. I do think that um, the idea that models come out of databases or can be associated with machine learning is a very limited class of model and that we shouldn't lose sight of what is often the, the key aspect of modeling, and particularly in the sense that Mark was talking about and I, I think Chandra as well, is that modeling is essentially a creative exercise where you're using insight to make approximations based on your understanding of mechanism. And I mean, if you think Euler, Navier-Stokes, Maxwell, I mean, what you're coming up with is a, a representation of reality that's very much based on your physical insight into processes in a way that you end up with an appropriately simplified description to answer particular questions. And there's, n there's no way that you get that out of automatically generating out of a database or a, an image set or a machine learning environment. It's a creative process. I, yeah, I would just right. re-emphasize the fact that the, the model is not the thing that it's modeling. It's a, it is a, an abstraction in one way or another. And the question is, what is the question you're asking of the model, and is it, is it pertinent to the model itself? Uh, the self-assembly model is, doesn't explain uh, how viruses put themselves together in any detail, but it shows certain abstract aspects of self-assembly, and you can learn a lot from, from the model itself. So, so it's, it's how you use the model that really defines how good the model is. And unfortunately, we need to finish, so that will be the last question by Terry, please. Yeah, so I, I'd like to um, add in a comment, not for myself, but for Francis Crick, who was a colleague of mine at the Salk Institute for many years. And, and one day we were talking about modeling. And, and I, don't, you know, I didn't quite appreciate it, but in fact, probably the world's best biological model was that model of DNA that he and Jim Watson came up with, right? It was a physical model, it was a conceptual model, it had implications. You know, it's, it really was important. And he said, Terry, you're, you're too fond of your model. And, and he was right. I mean, you, you, you grew up with it, you really put a lot of time and effort into it, it's like a baby. But he said, no, no, that's the pur pur it's, it's not an end in itself, it's just a tool. And that really, the purpose of a model is f to design a killer experiment that you wouldn't otherwise have thought of doing that would give away the game. Because ultimately, that's understanding is the, is the purpose. And however you get there, I mean, everybody's going to take a different route. Ultimately, that's where we need to cooperate and collaborate in, in order to be able to do that, to come up with the, the killer experiment. That's a great comment. I'm not sure if nobody from panel want to add to this. I think that would be end perfect end to our discussion. I, and I can only wish that in the end of the half, right? We're going to come up with some kind of plan that we're going to come up with beautiful model as great as DNA in very short time, five year time period, right? And you know, at some point, that model not going to be even cited because it becomes word, right? I mean, one, one comment on that, which sure. is that I totally agree. And if you read the memoirs, how important that model was for Watson and Crick. But if you read the paper, they don't mention the model. So the, the point of that is that we don't talk about how we get our ideas in our paper. We talk about how we prove our ideas. And, and so there's a lot lost in our publications. And that's true, too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everybody.